Okay, uh, let's get it started. So this week, we are going to touch base on another very important topic in order to uh, establish your machine learning understanding thoroughly. So last couple of weeks, we majorly go through linear algebra. So uh, we play with vectors, matrix, you know, how to do the multiplication of matrices and also use the squared matrix as a rotator or operator to change other uh, vectors direction or magnitude. Uh, so this week, uh, from my understanding, so the machine learning is built on these two pillows. One is a lineage algebra, another will be this probability theory and the statistics for sure. And the rest of them are important but not necessary. So if you don't know uh, calculators, you don't know how to calculate those uh, derivative, it's okay. You can still uh, using this optimization black box to do this optimization. So you don't even know what's going on inside, but it still works. But you still have to know uh, the basic terminology in linear algebra, you know the eigenvalue, eigenvectors, and then uh, a probability distribution, what that means, especially today is very important. Everybody heard about the genet uh, generative model? Generative models, yeah. Uh, this it's hot topic recently, uh, uh, but then, okay, generative model. So model is a statistic models. And so uh, today we have to solve the problem and what is the model when, when statistician talk about modeling and build a model, what that mean? And also we will, uh, See, okay, once you understand what the probability is, what the distribution, what the, the generative means. Generative basically is just, I will generate new data points which wasn't there, but based on some of the understanding of your model. So generative model can be used, for example, ChatGPT is a large language model. It is a trend generative model. The ChatGPT, uh, the model, what it does is to generate the next word based on the probability. If 95% should be this word, the generator will pop up this word, 95%. And then next, next, just more complex than uh, the one we are going to discuss. Like the simplest model is what, what do you think the simplest model should be? I have a distribution like this. Uh, <coughs> so in this, in this axis is your value and the, uh, a number for your data. Okay, we generate a, a series of number. And this side is the, the frequency, okay? And then if you have a continuous uh, variable, this value will be uh, not, not uh, discrete, so, but uh, we can prepare this so-called distribution or uh, function, uh, so uh, probability distribution PDF function. Uh, by bin them, we can bin them, say from this value to here, what's the, the frequency and what's that frequency. Basically, you, you build a histogram, okay? If it's a continuous variable, you can make this bin very thin and uh, just very small steps and uh, even you cannot see them, maybe it's even over the precision of the computer can handle. In that case, you, you build a continuous variable. This is called a distribution. We are using a uh, function uh, density, probability density function to replace the histogram. Okay, everybody knows how to do the histogram. Uh, this could be frequency. If you have numbers, you can count, it's the same. All right, you normalize it. 
as I said, what is the simplest one? The simplest one will be a distribution which is purely random. It will be like this. My value is from 0 to 1. And my frequency for the spins are all the same. So to me, this is the simplest model I can have. What that means is I will, if I do a generator, I will generate a model, and I will generate a series of points. But this series of points will be drawn randomly from this distribution. And because all the bar are the same height, they are equal frequent. Uh, so I can draw randomly at any point here, OK? So if I use this as my model to generate my data, my generator is a random generator. In MATLAB, it's easy. It's a function called RND, OK? If you do any nothing, it will give you a random number and either located in this bin or that bin. And it generates a continuous variable. So you see uh, uh, a decimal number. Okay, You can run this many times. And the number will be jumping around in here. No, this, this distribution, the simplest distribution, generates numbers between 0 and 1. Yeah. OK, certainly today we are going to talk about more uh, different type of the uh, probability and different type of uh, distributions, which are more complex than this uniformly random okay, the distributed distribution. And the reason is our data, what we will see, we will observe. Many of them not follow this pattern. Okay, so the sim another extension will be the number we uh, we got is a distribution like a Gaussian, and then uh, in that case, you uh, centered at zero, and then you uh, histogram looks like uh, this, and make it continuous, and then it become a normal distributed curve. Okay. In that case, we, uh, we run random generator. If based on this, um, we will generate, for example, uh, negative 0 0.52 and 0 0.3 positive. So we will generate uh, data points which centered around 0, but there are possibility you can extend your value to this end or that end, OK? So you can do this by not generating random n, but the, 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 the function is called R-A-N-D-N. N means normal distributed. So in this case, uh, the difference, I don't know if you see, you can see it clearly. This function generate uniformly distributed random number between 0 and 1. And this R, A, and D, N generate a normal distributed random number centered around 0. And you may not see the difference. You say, OK. I generated this random number, uh, 0 0.6604. Seems like it's same as R&D and generated, right? You don't see the, the major difference. But the, once you run a lot, you start to see the difference, OK? So you need to go back to 
collect your data and you not uh, they, they may, the data may be randomly generated, but you have to collect them and uh, do statistics on them to figure out the original generative model. Okay? We are doing the generator, using generator to generate a lot of data. The other way around, you collect those data, you want to study them to infer those parameters to understand what's under the underlying uh, distribution the generator is using. So we are doing this generative model, generated data, and uh, using generated data to figure out what the distribution the generator is using. Make sense? Okay. So this function is different from uh, R and D. because they're based on the different models, okay? So, uh, we will introduce a couple of the distribution. There, there are many, many, and this uh, lecture is not designed for that. I can go through several of them that will be used in our uh, single cell data modeling. Okay, we will talk definitely and uh, normal Poisson negative uh, binomial and the T distribution. Okay, we will describe once you have data points, you have observation, you have a lot of data, and what you can do, you can focus on the descriptive statistics. You know, you can calculate the mean, you can variance. There are different ways to calculate variance and the, to understand the variability. Um, then we will review again, how can you compute uh, covariance matrix prepare for our uh, next week's lecture in the PCA. And we also want to look at the covariance matrix and understand what, what that means. Uh, and uh, I will have a lot of small uh, concepts, uh, the, uh, the terminologies. One of this is uh, like a KL divergence. You certainly need to know this, and the people use so widely in machine learning to understand the dis difference between, between two distributions. So what's the difference? How quantity, qu quantify the difference between this distribution versus this or versus that, okay? People use KL divergence to compute a, a number to tell you the difference between not the vector, not the data points, but the difference between distributions. Any questions? All right, so um, you have seen this before and uh, this is real data. Um, so last uh, computer session, we learned you can compute the uh, summation, the column uh, add up, and you know that it's called liberal size. Um, I use a small example to see, okay, revisit liberal size normalization. So when you calculate the summation of the, the total of the rows, those are the uh, expression total of this particular gene, and then the columns are the liberal size, basically how many UMIs, how many rays have been count as a UMI in per cell, and then uh, across all the genes, okay? And then you can see some of this have been oversampled if you consider those cells are the homogeneous population, all right? And you believe this is oversampled by some kind of bias, so you want to con correct those and to uh, introduce a factor and for those lowly expressed or sampled less uh, uh, cells. This is normalization. We try to uh, normalize the liberal size to give the results that, that becomes equal to all the cells by their liberal size. How, so how can we do that? We calculate a mean of the overall 
uh, uh, lipocytes across all the cells. So on average, we have 5.29 uh, UMI lipocytes for the cell, and some is larger, some is smaller. Then we divide this value, okay? Uh, this factor and then uh, allow them, for example, their, uh, uh, th this cell was 10, but after normalization, it becomes the same as another cells. So basically, you divide it yourself uh, and then multiply, multiplicate to uh, this, this average across all the, all the ones, okay? So what do you do? You divide all the values by, by the total. Basically, you make a percentage or the, the, the portion, okay? Then you, after you divide by your total, when you sum the column again, everybody becomes one, okay? Then you really scaled it by the, the mean or some other numbers, a constant, then everybody is the same value. So people are routinely do this, and uh, in my package we also do this, but uh, there's a problem with that. Uh, so that's the way you, you do, you do the summation, and then that's by column, and then you divide each, so this becomes liberal size for each cell, it's a vector. And then you use big X divide by the, the vector, so each column divide by it, this, total by uh, corresponding uh, label size, and you normalize it into uh, fraction, and then you multiply it by either this 10,000, or in my, this case, is multiply by the average, either way. This chart is from, uh, this figure is from this uh, paper, and it's a paper which discussed next generation sequencing data normalization. And uh, this is the raw data, they have a one to three genes. Uh, then you have two samples. This is for bulk rna seq but you can consider this like a gene, cell one, cell two, the same. And uh, if you compare these two samples, and you know uh, for gene one, the first sample is upregulated, have a high value than the control, and then the second gene, uh, 10, 15, have a lower uh, value than control. Well, when you, after you do this liberal size normalization, the number becomes this, okay? You still keep the same. Uh, that's what we are, we are doing, and uh, for this C is called the uh, RPKM is another way to do this normalization. Uh, this is widely used in bulk RNA-seq. Uh, essentially, this is a liberal size normalization. No difference from that. The only difference is the value will be further divided by the length of a gene. Okay? So, uh, if you look at the information, there are small number under each gene tells you how long this gene body is. If a gene is really long compared to another shorter gene, and then uh, on average you should expect most rates have been aligned to the longer gene. So you want to normalize those uh, gene lengths. So that's what the RPKM is doing. After liberal size normalization, do one more step to normalize, to divide by the length of the gene. Okay, in that way you can compare gene one with gene two, even though they are not in the same length, gene body length. Okay, and uh, uh, in bulk RNA seq world, people also use this package called the DE seq, and the DE seq take a different strategy, and it use geometric mean in the middle, and also take this scaling factor compute for the uh, the global, and uh, I. This is a popular, basically like golden standard. However, if you look at the, uh, the results, it changed uh, the, 
uh, original, and the original look, gene one is higher in sample one, and uh, gene two is lower in sample one. Uh, but uh, like DESIC, after doing this, and you you don't see the difference between two samples in gene two and three. So this is like a consequence. Uh, we don't know whether this change the conclusion of some of these studies or uh, distort the data and make it better or uh, more accurate or not. So we don't know. There are many, many problems associated with the different ways of normalization. So we, uh, we do need to know how this normalization has been done in uh, when you study uh, working with your own data. Okay, you don't want to just follow the popular uh, strategy. And the DESIG is widely used in single cell data analysis as well. A lot of people say, I want to use the DESIG to normalize my single cell data. We don't know the consequence yet. Okay, there, there, there's some field we are still discussing. Yes? Yeah, DESIC, if you look at their uh, the package, they use geometric mean instead of average the, uh, uh, the, the regular. Uh, I, I don't know why they use that, but uh, that's the way they choose. Mm -hmm. So this problem even more severe because we are dealing with not a different samples. So in bulk RSA people uh, study those samples, they, you normally assume sample one, sample two, they're comparable. They, uh, they have a different uh, uh, gene expression for particular genes, but not globally. Not to say, okay, for sample two, uh, all the 6,000 genes upregulated compared to sample one. Maybe just like a different uh, temperature you sample those cells, uh, but we, we don't assume that. Uh, but in single cell study, you just cannot avoid those because look like this, look at this macrophage is much larger than uh, lymphocytes and the neutrophiles. And uh, so, this contains more MRAs by itself. Um, so before you normalize it and uh, uh, you assume, because the normalization is before you dis uh, de detect the cell type, so you still assume all the cell have the average, the similar total amount of MRA in there. However, you see, okay, the the liberal size for macrophage actually larger than T cells, but you still consider them as a, uh, the same homogeneous population, and you try to uh, normalize there. So you you push down the liberal size proportionally and uh, artificially increase the, the liberal size and make them same even at the end. Um, all the genes within these cells will be following this uh, distortion or strength of your uh, rescaling re, re of your uh, expression. And then if you look, focus on one of this particular gene, it looks like gene A actually express level is higher in neutrophil than macrophage, which is not true maybe, okay? If you know the function maybe. So, this introduced some problem, and uh, we don't know how to solve it yet. Yeah, so people just still using liberal size normalization or don't do normalization at all. Yeah. One type, you, you still normally will do it. Do it, yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but then, the, do you need to come out first? Let's like say you, you cut out extremely low one. Right? Yeah, so that's, that's the QC and the quality control. You get rid of those outer layer points. But we are talking about after that step. You have, a, you have this filtered 
and then you believe the clean matrix, and then what you do, do uh, next, you want to normalize, uh, yeah, somehow uh, normalize the library size. So to me, the best way is to do this estimation. We want to estimate each cell by uh, given its own expected uh, li library size you should be, and maybe look at the population, different clusters, uh, detect, uh, for example, cluster first. And you know, okay, my population have uh, three major clusters. They all have a different library size. And I will treat uh, cluster one, normalize it by the self, cluster two, normalize by the self, cluster three by the self. But uh, how, before you class normalize it, how do you know there are three clusters, why not a four? So this has become a loop. You want to learn from the data first, class them, and then treat them separately. Uh, so this is like a circle. You want to understand multiple parameters f using uh, this eternity, uh, uh, eternate, uh, iterative learning and uh, to set some parameter, then learn another, then do this circle until you fit all your data uh, nicely using uh, some of those statistic parameters to de describe your uh, number of uh, clusters, each cluster's mean, each cluster's average library size, each cluster's uh, variability. In that case, you understand your data better than just treat them as a whole uh, population. Uh, uh, okay. However, this procedure uh, is computationally expensive. You have a lot of parameters to estimate and do loop again and again. So uh, software users just not patient enough. We want to click and get it done and follow the next step. So nobody will adapt to this in their package. This take very long time if you, if you run this biscuit uh, package. OK. but. It, you have to know there, there's a better way to do it. So uh, again, we come back to our basic concept. So I put, put yourself in this data analysis of a single cell RNA sequencing uh, analysis. But uh, this is a more general. You have a, uh, this function generate data, and you want to uh, look at their uh, distribution of a uh, uh, and then to, to learn this function, to understand the model. So uh, that's your data, you collected or you observed, and then you uh, do statistics, you learn the average, the, the, the variability, and then you see, okay, my data should generate from this particular model, particular distribution, and then uh, you can see, I can draw from here to see whether I can regenerate it the same kind of data or look similar artificial data sets. All right, so this is what we are doing this loop. And uh, if you uh, have a latest function of this two I developed, and you will see I uh, put a new function. So they're all the same. I reorganized the menu a little bit. So here there's a very difficult to see, but uh, there's a, a data simulator, okay? If you don't have this, you can generate uh, a single cell data expression uh, matrix to simulate. And I can, um, so I have done this, and uh, this will ask how many cells, how many genes that you want to simulate, and then, um, click this button, and then the, the procedure will be a random generator. So I will generate a zero, another zero, another 15, five for this particular gene, and then do another. Okay, another gene maybe have a higher expression. So at the end, I generate a matrix like this. Okay, so this is the first gene, and some zeros, and uh, there are some genes maybe expression levels are higher. Um, so if I don't tell you whether this is true or not, you may uh, don't know whether uh, this is from a real data and, or not. So 
my example here, uh, this one is from a real data. This is from a real data, and that is generated. Okay, I'm going to use this example to see how you can generate data. For example, we are um, trying to simulate uh, the, um, a game that we try to generate a list of uh, uh, numbers, those numbers of the height of the men in different countries, that's the European countries, and the left, it, we will generate the Italian, and they have an average uh, 1.76 meters and the Swedish, Sweden, 1.81. So these two numbers are my model. So I know they have a different average. So Italian have a uh, lower average, where Sweden have a little bit higher. So if you want to generate this data on your mind, you will write maybe uh, Italian, you may write 1.74, 1.75, and then here you will automatically write a number around 1.81, 1.85, 1.79. So you know the difference, okay? So what you are doing on your mind or play this game, you are doing a generative model, modeling, model your data. Uh, so this is the same as what I draw on the, on the board. If you have just a couple of data, then they are not enough. You don't see the whole pattern or whole trend of the distribution. However, once you collect enough, you can build a histogram based on how many uh, data points in each bin, okay, the frequency. And the, when you collect enough, you can smoothed that become a distribution a shape and uh, you see the, the the mathematical symbol changed from this summation the sigma become this okay this means continuous uh, aggre uh, aggregation okay integral integrals but in computer, and you know computer is based on the discrete zero ones, eventually, even you have this mathematical uh, integral, you have to, in computer, discrete, discrete it into bins. It's just very small bins, okay? <coughs> then we have uh, probability mass function, those for the discrete numbers, okay? And those for the density function is for the continuous, then you have a, a cumulative distribution. So this is a widely used Gaussian uh, distribution, also called a normal distribution. You have two parameters to define this curve. One is this mu, which is average, and then sigma is the, the standard uh, a standard deviation or deviation? Standard deviation. And the sigma squared is variation, okay? Variance. So can we use normal distribution to model our single cell data? So if I use normal distribution to generate my UMI count, it will look very different from what I simulated here. Remember, this is my simulation. Normal distributed value uh, assumption will not generate this table, okay? So I have to use something different to model my uh, single cell data. This is my, not my subject, but it's for statisticians and they focus on looking at this table, what is the best distribution they should use and what family of this uh, distribution they should use. There are so many, there, normal is here, uniform is here, okay, person, negative binomial, uh, binomial, gamma, beta, T, 
there, there are so many. What they eventually found is negative binomial distribution is the best, okay? So we will spend five minutes to explain this, what it is. Um, so when I see a binomial, I mean, there's two consequences is e yes or no, or either succeed or fail. Um, so that's binomial. And uh, for this, the distribution is, um, I want to know a number, say x. So what's the probability for x? x is the number of failures until r succeeds in the independent Bernoulli trials, trials. So uh, in order to compute this, I need to know, okay, uh, what's the uh, we need to know the, the successful rate. Okay, we need to know P. So P, uh, let's see whether I should use a P. In that case, it's P. Small P, okay, is the probability of, uh, say, failures, okay? If you think this like a, in the factory, you produce some product and the defect rate for this product is 0 0.05, for example. That means when you produce 100, this product, there are five of them may have a problem. So there's a, a P. So if you see, use a P Q as a uh, one minus P, so this will be the numbers of successful. Um, let's translate this directly into single cell, okay? Uh, this number assumed to be small and this large. And in single cell, we see, okay, the P will be the, the MRA will be detected. So this will be not detected. So I just translate this general term in uh, statistics textbook and into our single cell uh, contact. So uh, there, are, it's very difficult to detect the cell uh, 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 MRA, particular MRA in the cell. So we have a very low rate of detection, but there are high chance you're not detected. So now we are going to compute X, for example, I, I detect three copies of particular gene. So my X is three. I would say using negative binomial to tell me if my successful rate of detection is 0 0.05, I detect three copies of that MRA. So how many? trials I need to do before, uh, before I can get, I can get a three uh, success. So there's another parameters R. It's how many trials I have to do until I detect three copy. That's the frequency of this expected. In this small chart, there are three uh, example negative binomial distribution, but using different parameter values. And the 0 0.6, uh, let's look at this blue one. So 0 0.3 is a, this failure, failure rate. And the seven means if you do uh,
how many trials you need to do. Uh, on average, for, for example, 15 times in order you get seven failures. Translate into our MRA detection is if you detect seven copies of that gene, the your detection rate is 0 0.3, you need on average to try 15 times. If you look at this curve, okay, most likely you have to try 15 times in order you get seven times of that. Now I translate into MRA detection. So you see three copies of your, in this case, seven copies of your MRA. But the real MRA should be on average 15 or at that level on average in order to you to use 0.3% of success rate to detect seven copies, the most likely the background should be. So <laughs> there's, there's some of this uh, uh, language uh, change in order to, to see, okay, how many trials, so how many copies in the pool is already there. You have to use 0.3 success rate to detect seven copies. So you can compute that. And this is the uh, negative binomial random number generator. Okay, I showed you the uniformly random number generator and show you the normal distributed random number generator. And this is a negative binomial random generator. The table I generated is using this. Okay, but I have to set up two parameters for each cell and see which, whether uh, how many trials you uh, uh, the number corresponding R. So I, I have to give R and the P. I have to fix the detection rate, say 0 0.05, and I have give to uh, this number R, which is uh, corresponding number of success, and then to let it to generate. This is an example they used in explanation for this function. So suppose we want to simulate a process which has a defect probability, so that's a, a production of this factory produce production, at 0 0.01, how many units might quantity assurance inspect before found three defective items. So that's the way you compute uh, using this random number, but compute many six times, okay? Then you take average. So again, translate that into uh, the opposite, your detecting rate instead of defect, defect probability. And then you change that into the, the language of the detecting MRAs. So you see, okay, we have a, uh, you have my count for this gene, the three, and how many MRAs should be in there, express ready for you to try on, and you, until you get three uh, read out. So I just basically change this to uh, the language in in, the, in, the, in single cell analysis. Um, so th there's multiple steps in the process of the detection and their um, this uh, reverse transcription uh, rate, okay, amplification factor, uh, dilution, sequencing dips. So if you really want to simulate those steps and there's not only just negative bi binomial 
and you, sh you probably want, will consider a lot of parameters. And some of those parameters are shared between cells because it's per run. Uh, but if you have another uh, samples maybe run in different batches, then you probably have to adjust all this. Uh, so there are, those are the something which people will consider in order to understand the data and the simul uh, to infer what the real MRA concentration is for every single genes in there. Um, once you understand those, you can start to regenerate and refill some zeros if you believe those are the missing values from the detection rate because of technology sensitivity is not high enough, so you miss that. So those are the technical dropout. Uh, people want to use different ap approach, try to impute those values, okay? It's a zero, you, you believe it's supposed to be 0 0.05, so you reintroduce 0 0.05 into that particular location for a particular gene in a particular cell. It's sometimes reasonable if you have a, a, a gene which all the cells, uh, neighbor cells have a 15, okay, UMIs, and suddenly your cell becomes zero, you probably want to fit that in 7.5 something, and because you know across the distribution it's supposed to be non-zero. Uh, so people developed a lot of method. The, uh, I collect those. Uh, the top six is called model-based. So in those methods, uh, we try to say, okay, there are some kind of distribution from the data. We want to regenerate them. Uh, there are other methods which are not based on the assumption of any statistic model. It's just purely on the average cross data points, for example. So those are like the data driving and the smoothing method to, to take average. You, I don't care whether you generate from a negative binomial or from a person or from a normal. I just fill the gap, interpret it. Uh, interpret those, those data points, empty data points. There are deep learning method using neural network. Uh, so they uh, probably need the training data, okay? And you know how to set up those, preset those parameters in order to do a generated model, not based on distribution, but on some of the nonlinear uh, relationship and generate those. There are uh, random uh, factorization, uh, maybe the based on the multiplication of, of the uh, matrix to do those. Anyway, so uh, those are the imputation method using uh, statistical modeling. This is one example, and uh, there are two distributions and the, the uh, one distribution gave the distribution of a parameter for another distribution. So another distribution will use this change the parameter to uh, to generate the data. So basically, uh, there, there are two parameters for gamma distribution create this mean every gene, a single gene in single cell, and then this lambda will be plugged in this Poisson distribution, that this Poisson distribution becomes the, the final data generators and the pump up those values. So this will be zero, one, two, something like that, okay? But it's changed all the time based on the, another distribution of a gamma to simulate the average cross cell population. Otherwise, if this is fixed, unchanged, all the cells have the same level of mean, so it's not realistic. Similar here, and this another uh, SC impute method, uh, do those f steps and also assume there's uh, negative binomial distribution 
uh, then try to simulate, generate that, and then compare uh, with uh, with the real data, and do some iteration and uh, through compared to the, with the real one, and start to adjust the parameters for negative binomial per per gene, I believe, then uh, try to find uh, combinations of the vector. Each, each element in the vector is average, expected average of that gene. Look at this and compare with uh, the real data and uh, try to minimize the difference between your reconstruct and that uh, original. At the end, to reach this purpose of the imputation. OK, uh, we move to descriptive statistics. And we now we are not talking about the distribution. We are not thinking about this uh, uh, underlying principle, uh, the driver force for the data generation. But we are uh, given a vector of data or a matrix. And then what we can do, we can do this, uh, understand the central uh, tendency, which you use a mean or medium or mode, and then the position and the, the rank. Okay, You can look at the frequency, so each bin, how many data points uh, was, uh, dropped in that bin. And then you describe the discrepancy is the variation. So what's the largest value and the smallest value? What's the range between them? Uh, uh, for example, this uh, standard deviation, those things. Um, so based on those descriptions, you start to generate your hypothesis of the potential possible distributions and start to estimate those values which can be used to regenerate your data. Um, so this is a normal distribution with different parameters, uh, average and uh, uh, variance, and it gave you a different shape and the dispersion of this uh, data distributed. And this is for uh, P PMF, okay, for discreted. And then you can add them up, and it becomes uh, cumulative. And this is also this is a, a density distribution. This is a cumulative. Cumulative is from zero to one, and uh, uh, you just add them up all these bars. Okay. So when you move to the right end, the higher value, and you see okay. Um, when I move to 150 in this example, I will cover all the 100% of the data points. Um, if I am in the 100 position, I will cover 50%. Then you look at the y-axis, you know the percentage, which data points you uh, covered, basically. Um, we use a lot of box plot, and this box plot was plot horizontally, but normally we have a uh, vertical. And remember, this box was not uh, just put there by look uh, good looking. There is meaning of that. In the mid middle, this bar is a medium, and then you have a 25 percentile and a 75 percentile. So you know uh, the 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 points which distributed between them, OK? And then you have some decisions of where you want to put outer layer points. So there, there are some definition. Definitely, people follow this rule. So once you see the box plot, you know, OK, how many points inside the box, how many outside, which data are the, how many are the outer layers. So this is a PDF, CDF, and the box plot for normal distribution. So you see uh, the shape, the the balanced, the 
uh, percentile, okay? And this particular distribution have uh, this plateau in the middle, and then you see the change of the CDF and the gradually climb to 100%. It's not like uh, steep as a uh, normal distribution because of the plateau uh, existing. And then also this bar will become wider. And in contrast, if you have a PDF, which is a sharp peak, and then you have very quick jump in your CDF. So uh, this will, you, when you see this, you will have a uh, picture on your mind is the distribution like that. And if you have a very narrow uh, box, and then you know, okay, uh, all the data points are very centralized in in the mid, in the mean or median. This is a, a skewed uh, distribution, and then you have a long tail on the larger value side, so you keep going until uh, very large x value, you reach to 100% to cover all the data points, and this box plot distribution with outer layers on your right side. If you have a bimodal distribution, then you have two peaks, and you start to see this quick increase in half uh, in the, this part of this CDF and then another increased place. Well, that information will be lost if you use box plot to, to show your uh, data. So, okay, I think we can take a five minutes break before time we should come back. Yeah, come back one past 11.
Okay, uh, so this graph is trying to explain what is the p-value. Um, so if you uh, have your assumption of the statistical model, so you know uh, this distribution, so you know you have an average at four, and then the standard deviation like that, and it gave you this value. So based on this assumption, you can compute for any observed value. So if you observe a value which located at uh, this position uh, here, and then you see, okay, based on my PDF, so here, okay, based on you, uh, for example, CDF will be better, then you see, okay, uh, there are 95 percent of supposed to be observed data point will be smaller than than my op this observed then you have your significant is uh, one minus 95 percent so this is just gave you the idea to 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 calculate the p-value when people say okay i got a p-value your first question you sh you can ask as a universal question is what's your distribution what type of your distribution is what's your assumption is without answering that question, the people shouldn't answer, shouldn't know how they compute the p-values. A lot of people doing the permutation test, they got the p-values, and you assume, oh, I have 0 0.01. What they did is try different random numbers and they say, okay, so they don't have assumptions. So in that case, they should tell you we are using permutation tests instead of uh, statistic tests. We have no model, it's model free, and uh, get a p-value. They're, they're not a standard p-value as a statistician, you'll see, okay? So another small uh, terminology concept is a z-score, and this is a, called a standardized random variable. So you can get a vector of a data uh, Cx, and you, um, that's your observation, then the x, this mean, x bar is, is average, then you, every value of your vector minus is mean, so you basically centralize your data to, to the zero, okay? So mean means half of the data have greater than this, maybe half smaller than that. So once you have your data point minus its mean average, then you get some positive value, some negative value balanced. Then that means you move your data points to the center, you centered by the mean. And then you divide by its standard deviation uh, and put the variance of this value into uh, one. So once you you do this transformation, it's called a standardized, and your data becomes, I had this normal distribution around zero and with variance equals to one. So this is a very strong uh, transformation to put every, uh, put, put the data point no matter how uh, far away from the, the zero, move to zero and also no matter how dispersed they are will push you back to uh, with variance equals to one so when you use this transformation we'll be very careful because you you uh, you move your mean and you compare to another uh, vector and also you move to the mean and then uh, forces have a same distribution uh, and also the variance okay it's a very strong transformation. Standardize your variance. Another uh, concept I want to mention is we also always uh, have this problem called the multiple testing correction. Um, so people use so-called Bofferoni correction to give you Q value instead of a P value. Why we don't use this conventional P value like this? So you observe your data, you have your assumption, but you, why not use this nominal p-value? It's a straightforward 5%. Uh, why you want to do this correction? 
the reason is you have your assumption like normal distribution, but you are doing not only one observation, but many, many. Just like you, you put this uh, beam machine and uh, you, you draw this beam into here uh, many, many times. If you only draw once, and you been jumped to this end. This is not a euro situation. This is an euro event. This is significant. However, if you do this hundreds, thousands of times, there's one time you been jumped to here. This is not so uh, surprising because you are using multiple data points to rebuild your whole distribution. So you expect. By doing this thousands of times, some of those observations should be far away from the center because you are rebuilding this whole distribution. So that's why uh, when you see this observation within the multiple testing situation, you won't be feel surprised because the, this is not a single event. It's not only one time trial. It's continuous multiple trials. So that's why you need to set up even more stringent bar. I see I not surprising here, I have to set my p value cut off here instead of the conventional five percent. Okay? You want to say set zero point zero five percent, something like that. To correct your multiple testing problem. That's why people choose more stringent cutoff to do this correction instead of use the p-value and uh, zero, you get a 0 0.05, I will divide by, uh, you, you see the p-value cut off 0 0.05. Um, if you do n trials, say 1,000 trials, I will uh, set up my new cutoff p-value, 0 0.05 divided by 1,000. So this is the most stringent cutoff. So I need to get a p-value smaller than this in order to claim it's significant after multiple correction. Okay, this is the purpose. So this is doing, and uh, uh, so your original cutoff is alpha. Okay, 0 0.05. So if you only do multiple tests five times, you should set your cutoff 0 0.01 using this to divide by that number. If you have 0 0.05, 100 trials, you should have a new setup to 0 0.005. This is called a buffer only corrected cutoff. And then if you have your p values smaller than this, you will see, okay, it's significant and you claim we have done this so-called buffer only correction and my uh, corrected p-value is still significant. In that case, you can claim you are, you are okay. Um, all these distribution are connected somehow and uh, one may be another special case when some multiple uh, parameter, one of them become fixed to zero and then one normal distribution become another. So those are the uh, potential links between different distributions. Um, I will explain the person distribution a little bit. So this is to simulate those discrete uh, uh, low frequent event. Um, for example, uh, in this case will be a uh, Traffic, say traffic volume uh, uh, detection or estimation. So people probably know uh, over the year and uh, how many how many cars in the past this intersection. So if you have a large number here, uh, divide by days and maybe 24 hours, uh, 60. So you divide by, by this number and they get a P. This P really small, right? This means 
over the year, I have so many cars pass by this intersection, but now I calculate per minute on average how many cars I should have. Uh, this is like a uh, average number of the cars, see, given lambda. Okay, average minute, maybe three. So I calculate from a large number of statistics and to calculate the frequency of a small event will happen. And that's my lambda three, okay? Then I will compute, so uh, what's the frequency if I stay here for one minute? How many cars will pass by? My probability of two cars will pass by is given by this bar, which is a, li a little bit higher than 20%. What's the probability I observe this in next minute, there's one car pass by, this one is here, 15%. Okay, so that's this, this di distribution means. So in order to create this histogram, we need one parameter is this average frequency of this rare event, which is a lambda equals three. If lambda equal two to seven, for example, then this distribution will change the shape. It will move to, to the right side. So if you are on average statistical for long term, uh, per minute, you expect the seven cars, then when you stay here for another minute, you will expect maybe four cars or five cars, or the higher possibility. Okay, you will still have a chance, the 5% in this case, no cars pass by in that particular minute. So on this side, there are three uh, curves. Each corresponds to different lambda. What we see before this lambda equals three, right? Here, lambda equals 10, four, one. When you have one, then uh, zero and one will be seven, uh, 37% equal, then you have a average, we will see three, two, then this one. So you know how to see this curve, to, to observe, okay? Interpret. And that's the equation you compute the, how high each bar is basically. This p-value is how high this bar for given parameters, okay? So here they use mu instead of a lambda to calculate uh, in the equation. Single cell will be the loading cell into droplets at a personal rate. For example, if you want to simulate this capture of the droplet capture cells, and then uh, you say, okay, I'll I know if I put one million uh, droplet and in my system, I probably will capture uh, 10,000, and then I have uh, this particular lambda values. And then you can start to compute in your real experiment how many uh, droplet will capture one cell, how many will be empty, how many will be two cells in there. So you want to change those parameters, change this capture rate, and then maybe density of the cell, the concentration of preparation, in order to uh, allow the capture of the single cell become maximized, right? So in this setup, you want to have uh, this, some, this particular yellow curve, which 
higher probability to capture uh, single cell rather than duplets and triplets, you still want to minimize the empty droplet. So some of those equations will be useful. And uh, load beans into droplets. So another procedure, and also maybe rely on some of this uh, personal rate. And also, people start to use zero inflated model. And uh, you can imagine you can have a zero inflated negative binomial model to simulate your data. This is like a two steps of procedure. First, you will count how many zeros in your particular gene expression in the collected cells. And you set up a percentage. And then you model those zeros separate from non-zeros. And this is like a combined uh, histogram. Then the, on your left is a zero inflated model. You see this bar here. And 40% of the cell of contains particular genes expression are zero. And then the rest of them using a different distribution to model, rather than just put everything into one distribution. OK, so the two steps. I want to mention T distribution with uh, uh, comparison between normal distribution. The reason we want to use introduce this the shape because later we will do Tisney. Uh, remember, Tisney is commonly used dimension reduction uh, technology. This T stands for T distribution, so that's why we want to show this difference. The dis difference between these two PDF is the normal distribution is more centralized, and then T distribution gave you uh, slightly more dispersed. And emphasize uh, this right and this left and right side of this uh, seeker fit, okay? Some, somehow like this. So if you uh, generate, see, random number based on the s standard normal distribution compared to t distribution you will find t distribution assumption will give you more uh, slightly more data points in this region okay then normal distribution so that region means the the value which uh, in the inter intermediate range okay so in Tisney, people use that technology to replace normal distribution to allow those uh, cells to be slightly away to each other rather than clustered in the center. So if you regenerate the, the cells in, in a, a, a plant form, then allow them to be away from each other a little bit, you will see them clearly and they are not uh, overlap onto each other compared to uh, use a standard normal distribution. That's the purpose people use T distribution, just push data points away from each other a little bit. Okay, so, uh, so this is like a formula for compute uh, mean and variance, and variance is you have your observation minus the expected mean and the take square and the expect value for, for, for this difference from your points to its mean. Um, each PDF has its own uh, analytic solution of what variance should be. So if you believe your data follow this distribution and you know uh, those parameters, you have those uh, set up already. Otherwise, you have to estimate from your data yourself, all right? <coughs> By the way, those parameters also may be estimated from your data. Uh, to describe the cent uh, central 
uh, tendency we use mean, medium, mode, so those are the difference, okay? And uh, yes, if you have a uh, skewed distribution, uh, otherwise they should be the same center. Uh, there are more uh, stati descriptive statistics to describe the dispersion. So this is more important even for us. Uh, we want to use range, which is largest against the smallest value in your observation. We want to have a deviation, a difference between uh, inch and the mean, uh, variance, and the standard deviation. So on this side, you have, uh, we will talk about the coverage and the variance variation. Okay. So this we use a lot in single cell data study. And uh, this is called the coefficient of vari variation. This is uh, uh, standard deviation divided by the mean. What that means is you have a vector of data, then you calculate standard deviation, then normalize the standard deviation with the mean. And uh, the reason doing this is that these two parameters may be correlated. So for a, a data set with a higher mean compared to another data set with another uh, different mean, and then the, the data set with a higher mean also have a higher vari uh, standard deviation. So uh, you want to control for that to make this variance comparable between this two sets of data, even though they have a different means. So that's the purpose of that. Uh, so you can also, uh, so this is standard deviation, you can also rewrite this into square root of variance divided by mean. If you do that uh, for person, person distribution, then you have a variance equal to mean. So you can replace uh, this variance use mu. In that case, it become CV equals to uh, square root of mean divided by mean. So that's an assumption for uh, Poisson distribution. If that's the case, if you take a log between both sides, then you have a log CV equals negative one half log mean. This become a linear relationship. That means if you compute uh, for C genes by their mean and the CV, if you take a log of them, then you will have a straight line here. Okay, each, each point is a gene. You compute across all the cells, okay? If, if those UMIs would generate using person random distribution, follow that model, you will get straight line by looking at multiple genes. Higher, higher mean, those genes should have a lower CV, and they are follow this straight line. And the, when we fit the real data, if you, we can play with this in computer uh, session, you will find a straight line. That means the real data follow person distribution very nicely. No matter uh, what type of genomics, chemical, different version you use, you always get this straight line basically. Very striking. So that's, that's why uh, statisticians really like single cell data because they have a noise, they have zeros, but they follow their expectation very nicely. So they can see, okay, we also cannot predict very accurately what the next gene in that cell will be, exp the level should be, but uh, collectively, there's, they, they follow this uh, beautifully, so we can do the imputation. We can see, okay, most of those technology uh, generated data are 
follow distribution of the person. We, we know very well about that. OK, so this illustration uh, to show you how to calculate a variance. All right, your data is in the fourth column of this x. You have six data points, OK, this column x. So you compute mean first. So this x bar 14 is the mean. And then you'd compute each data point, xi minus it's a mean, so in that case, you see some of positive, some negative. OK, you put them together, should be 0. Uh, then you square the value. Negative become positive as well. And then you sum them together. So this is the variance. This is the variance, and then uh, this is this part. So um, we normally normalize by the sample size because when you have more data points, then your variance become larger, and you want to divide by the number of n to take average. And the people found uh, n minus one is better to give you less biased estimation from a. Uh, theoretical expectation, so if you, you know those. So this is the way the formula to calcul calculate the variance, OK? All right, not hard. So the, what, what the variance means? This gave you uh, some idea how disperse the data points you collected in that 1D space, basically, OK? If you are highly dispersed, then you have a larger variance. Otherwise, you have more centralized distribution, then you have small variance. Uh, So this illustrates to calculate not the variance, but it's covariance that's between two vectors. OK, so uh, the variance is by itself. So within yourself, what's the, the difference, uh, the, the disperse, dispersion? This is two vectors. Two vectors, they are. See, uh, two variables, OK? In this case, we have samples, the same number of samples. How many here? Nine samples, OK? Two variables, x and y. So you calculate, you, you centralize first variable first. OK, by minor x bar and y minus y bar. So centralize those two, then product, put together, multiplicate those values. OK, you get this summation of total. If you replace y with x, you will get back the same of this as this. If y is same as x, so basically you compute variance with, with x itself. But this one is between two variables. And you get the value, and this value could be positive, could be negative. Uh, depends on this value of summation of those products. So this YouTube illustrates another way to calculate covariance uh, 
uh, and the variance together, they, uh, they use a very special uh, this matrix format the, at the end you get this matrix with in the diagonal position are uh, the the variance for different parameters and the off diagonal position are the covariance between variables okay so here variables are not uh, okay translate into our single cell it's a if you study cells as a sample, then your variables will be the gene. Now, what this covariance matrix means is you look at this gene's expression across cells. Uh, if you look at this gene itself, then that will be the variance of this gene, whether they express highly uh, high low high low whether there's very random or dispersed the covariance means gene a and the gene b whether they co-evolved or co-expressed and the positive basically indicate uh, they're more likely to be co-expressed and negative value will be the anti-correlation okay Sometimes we uh, plot out this scatter plot matrix, and those are the variables. And this each is a scatter plot for two different variables, and those are the same data points. Just look at uh, each pairs of the variables, and look at their scatter plot, and this you can find the correlation between variables. Okay, so this will be like gene one, gene two, gene three, gene four, gene five, gene six, maybe six genes. And then you look at the gene one, and gene two correlation, and each point should be a cell. Translate in that way. This two should be the same. Should be the same if you just flip it around. Okay, because x, y access change. This should be symmetric. So from the co covariance matrix, you can get correlation matrix. We know correlation is positive uh, 0 0.75 means Okay, some kind of significant correlation between these two variables. If you have a negative 0 0.8, there will be uh, this uh, slope of the, the, the line regression will be negative. The correlation matrix is somehow it's normalized covariance matrix. Okay, you, you get the covariance matrix and then divide by those, val those values, basically. Values of the standard uh, deviation of x and y. Any questions so far? Is it all right? Everything? Okay. Um, sometimes we want to uh, compare and see whether uh, your distribution is same as expected uh, assumption. So here, you have a normal distribution, then you, you do this so-called quantile, and then you look at your real data and you expected quantile for different values. And if you get a straight line, this so-called quantile quantile QQ plot, that means that's your real data distribution follow this, okay, this curve. Uh, you can also compare, say, two data sets. 
So this is from one data set, another from another data set. All you can do is you found uh, a data points which is quantized at the same uh, same quantile level, and if you use two different data sets and found where this should be, uh, if these two distributions are the same, you get a QQ plot, which in the uh, all the data points project on the, the, the this uh, uh, one one position, basically same quantile, same values. Okay, KL divergence. Uh, it's very important, the concept is based on the information theory. If you know the entropy or something like that, it also have a frequency and log of the, the ratio. This, this in, inside the core here, there's an information theory uh, behind that. So this is a measurement between similarity or difference between two distributions. In this example, you have a, a red curve compared to blue curve. And then you put, uh, you put, basically you, you put a histogram, this, the bins, okay? And to compare those bins frequency, basically this, the height means frequency of those uh, values okay. you draw from the inside that bin. Uh, for each bin, you compare uh, that height from a one is like red against blue, and here red is almost high, and here is almost zero. So there's the ratio somewhere built in here. And within this overlap part, you have a both, you have some values in there. Uh, then you, you plug in this and you calculate the uh, KL divergence. And the KL divergence is not uh, symmetric. And uh, uh, if you do KL divergence A compare B and B compare A, you get a different values. <coughs> This is a small example instead of using this continuous distribution, this using this uh, three bar and this histogram to show you how to compute uh, KL divergence. So your first distribution is like this. You have three values, 0, 1, 2. Your second distribution also is 0, 1, 2, but the uniformly distributed uh, is each one third probability. Uh, but this one here is, uh, this is high, almost 50% here in the middle one, and then uh, really low for the value for, for the two. So, so to compute that, you will have the distribution, uh, this is a P against the Q, and that's a percentage, okay, the height, the bar. And for the uniformly distributed, the Q distribution, you have the one third, one third, one third, well, in this one, uh, 0 0.36, and then 48, and 16. So you plug those numbers in this equation and take a log, take a ratio, and you get the KL divergence for comparison between distribution P against Q is 0 0.085. All right? This gave you estimation how different these two distributions are. KL divergence using Q as a reference against the P, then you get 0 0.097. Okay? So normally we just do uh, divergence of P against Q and the Q against the key, P and take average. Then you get the uh, two distributions, uh, KL divergence. That's
Can you imagine a situation that we will use KL divergence in our analysis? For example, I uh, assume my data was generated from negative binomial distribution, so I will set up these pr two parameters for normal negative binomial distribution. I will generate a lot of those data and make a distribution. Then I will compare with my real data. I assume real data also follow those distribution. And uh, then I can use KL divergence to compare, say, the number I generated have the same or very different distribution as my observed. That, that place where we use KL divergence. Remember, it's not one number against another. It's the statistics, the histogram from one data set compared to another histogram from another data set. OK? So you, the, the number you generated from the same gene, same cell, the first gene for cell may be very different from the first gene for cell in observed data. But collectively, as a distribution, you expect if you model that G, the data set nicely, use your uh, statistic model, you should generate a very similar distribution. Then we use KL divergence to evaluate the success of the your simulation. Yes. So uh, is it better to use the KL simulation with plot? Yes, yeah, so QQ plot is like a visual detection. It's uh, not give you the quantity. Uh, yeah, QQ plot is used a lot in the genetic study. You have a p value which much higher. Uh, Uh, within the sample compared to random, yeah. It's not in that case. It's compare, uh, say you have a, a thousand genes, and the, your assumption is one thousand genes, none of them uh, will be significant in terms of the p-value. But then you observed that you have, a, say, uh, 50 of genes significantly higher, uh, the p-value is smaller than the sum cutoff. So you can compare this to distribution of p-values using QQ plot. Uh, so in statistics, this is called a Simpson uh, paradox. That is, if you look at these two for example, genes expression, so one gene against another. If you look at uh, all the cells, then you think uh, when s s gene one express high and the gene two should also express high uh, on average across all the cells. So you have a regression curve like this, go through. If you can calculate uh, correlation coefficient, you will get these two genes relationship in terms of the whole population of cells, a positive correlation. However, if you look at the two cells clusters and the model, the correlation, study the correlation between these two genes, one cell type after another, you'll see, okay, in both cases, they are negatively correlated. So this create a paradox see, in statistics, whether you will use a subpopulation of data to infer the relationship between variables, or you want to add more to get a global estimation of those. We don't know which one is correct. So that's a Simpson uh, paradox. We have a lot of this situation. You use male mouse against the female mouse if they are if you don't consider uh, the sex difference, then you, you get one particular correlation between variables. But if you separate your animals into male, female, you get a, a completely different results. I think this last page, we will uh, say, OK, uh, 
occasionally you probably heard about the, uh, the likelihood, and they're related to the probability, but uh, not uh, uh, the same. Not the same. The likelihood means that how high you can get in your PDF this distribution for any observed data points, which the probability uh, or p-values sometimes means uh, so how many the percentage or likelihood uh, the data points will be smaller or greater than you observed. So you said you observed here, uh, see 95 would be smaller than me, so I will have be 5% significance. So that's the difference. And we use these terms to, uh, to do this when you do uh, optimization. And uh, you see, OK, I want to follow, as assume my data follow this particular distribution, but I don't know uh, where the mean is. So I will try a lot until all the data points give me the summation of the likelihood and maximize my total likelihood. Then I know, OK, I should put my normal distribution mean in the middle of this data point. So what you are doing is to try to maximize your likelihood of the, all the data points. Okay, So if you move your, your curve into the middle of the, and you sum all this uh, likelihood from all the data points based on your assumption, then you get the maximize the total likelihood. If you move away from that, a lot of those will give you a small likelihood, and so the summation will be so small. And also, you can uh, you use uh, mean and the standard deviation try to maximize uh, the likelihood, basically. OK, so let me know any points which you have uh, any confusion, questions. So you see, there's no slides with a star on there. So this very general go through everything. Uh, make you ready for next level. Okay. Right.